on behalf of Ascension Child Park CPC, I would like to welcome you all to this accepted luncheon event. I would also give a special thanks to the Columbus Corporate Network and Checkpoint for the support given to this event. And hello, my name is Cody. I'm honored to be your MC for today. Today's topic is entitled Tech Acceleration Reshaping the Business Landscape from AI, techno AI Automations to XDR Strategy. As we all noticed, the COVID-19 outbreak last year has forced many enterprises to undergo an overwhelming transformation in months, reshaping the future of all industry. Such abrupt changes has opened up many new opportunities to drive business growth. However, it also causes new security risk under the increasingly complex and automated business environment. In a matter of moments, you hear from our speakers and experts about the insight of digitalization opportunity and the future of work in Asia, as well as the latest security approach and data-driven cybersecurity strategy to protect your business. We hope that you find today's uh, event both interesting and informative. Thank you Sitting for inviting me here to join this uh, in-person event. It's really wonderful that uh, we're able to see each other the real person as opposed to little squares on, uh, online. So uh, my name is Janet Pao and I'm the director of the Economist Corporate Network here in Hong Kong. And uh, I'm really pleased to talk to you today about uh, tech acceleration in Asia. And uh, what I'm going to start with is to talk a little bit about what everyone's really interested in, which is what the post-COVID recovery timeline looks like, what it looks like for uh, different economies, and what kinds of digital adoption and tech acceleration, which is really an acceleration of technology, uh, trends have been going on during COVID and what's likely to stay afterwards. And I think for a lot of your companies, you're really thinking about how to accelerate the use of technologies uh, for your company's businesses, uh, how to ensure that uh, cybersecurity is in place, and there are so many opportunities that uh, in the post-COVID world that we'll see. So we'll, we'll hopefully uh, talk about it during the course of uh, the meeting today. And uh, you know, I'll also talk a little bit about the future of work because that's a really big topic of interest and hope that uh, you will be able to take away something valuable from here. So just looking at the Asian economies, uh, what we have seen last year was really a precipitous drop in uh, economic growth and GDP. Here I'm really uh, showing you a growth rebound for uh, all of the Asian economies in 2021. And of course we see the leaders ahead of the curve, uh, Taiwan, Vietnam, and China notably. Um, a lot of ASEAN countries are seeing a strong rebound uh, from a very low base. And even some of the economies that were hardest hit last year, including Singapore, uh, including Philippines and, uh, and also India are seeing a strong rebound. And what is really interesting is actually this yellow bar in 2022, which is when many of the economies in Asia will get back to a normal and more of a stable growth rate that is in line with their developmental stage. So we'll start seeing that uh, next year. And of course, some of the developed economies like Japan and, and the US are going back to low single digit growth. A movement across borders, we have done a a timeline uh, of when the vaccination looks like it's going to be rolled out and uh, you know of course this is being updated uh, every week as we hear more news and you know I think that even from when we did this timeline um, earlier this year uh, we were expecting that some of the developed Asian economies like Hong Kong, Singapore and Taiwan would reach a 60% immunization rate however what we have seen is immense vaccine hesitancy in some of these economies, uh, you know, here we know that in Hong Kong as well. So even though we say that uh, here we project that in quarter 2021, um, that some of the herd immunity is going to be reached, it might be a bit later because of the vaccine hesitancy. And of course, the next economies that follow are going to be some of the other economies like Australia, New Zealand, and Macau, followed then by uh, Japan, South Korea, and Vietnam, uh, well into 2022. So I think intuitively it sounds later than we want, but this is what we're expecting based on uh, the supply and demand dynamics and so forth. Um, international travel, uh, it will return, but it will look very different. 
So it, as an economist, we have cheekily called it the bubble trouble. So we talk about travel bubbles uh, around Asia. We have seen one between Taiwan and Palau come up. We're hearing about a trans-Tasman bubble between Australia and New Zealand uh, later this month, and Hong Kong is negotiating bubbles with economies as well. Um, it is, of course, a very disrupted industry in 2020, really a precipitous uh, in Asia, you know, almost 90% drop in international travel. Uh, but here I show you the UN World Tourism Organization scenarios uh, where there's a one scenario is a rebound in July, and one is a rebound uh, not until September. And in both cases, we will see, uh, you know, of course, a, 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 a large growth from a very low base. But uh, only in the first scenario, if things rebound by July, will international travel uh, go start going back to 2019 levels uh, later this year. But if not, uh, we are going to see a, a longer recovery path. So I think what what we all want to know is uh, how the shape of travel is changing. And the business and leisure travel recovery timelines are, are quite varied. Uh, at the Economist, we have done a poll with some of the, uh, the business executives. And it's a very interesting trend because it's going to be a bifurcated pattern between business travel and leisure travel. So uh, for the international business, uh, significantly less executives are saying that they anticipate uh, making international uh, trips in 2021 versus 2019, uh, 2019. However, for leisure travelers, there's a lot of pent up demand. So it's almost the reverse. As, uh, almost 75% are saying that, uh, you know, by uh, the end of 2021, they would have made a leisure trip that is not business related. And so what I want to then go into is this tech seller creation trend, what we have been seeing uh, during the pandemic. and. Uh, uh, again, at The Economist, we have called some of this automation and digital adoption a kind of forced automation. So when the pandemic first hit, everyone was really afraid of getting sick. So a lot of companies were starting to quickly pivot to technological solutions. So some of them are very much related to healthcare. So for instance, patient monitoring, uh, you know, the manufacturing, uh, using Internet of Things, that has been happening before the pandemic already, uh, which uh, some people don't really pay too much attention to unless they're in the industry, but the pandemic has really accelerated uh, some of these trends. And also uh, medical supplies and also essentials, right? Uh, on the logistics side and also on the, on the uh, warehousing side, a lot of companies have started using uh, much more, investing more in technologies to meet some of the demand volatility that we have seen, especially for the essential goods and medical supplies like PPE. And you know, here I'm just showing some digital opportunities by industries that we have seen that have come out of the, uh, of the pandemic. So of course, uh, e-commerce, uh, especially during the lockdown, we have seen a lot of gains and investments. Uh, cloud computing is another area of growth. Uh, financial services, fintech, and so forth are another area of growth. Uh, and of course, a continued use of digital health in different areas of healthcare, not just COVID. Those are new trends that we have seen uh, investments in, in the different sectors. So I think all of us have the experience during COVID of being locked out at home, we're purchasing things online. So one of the implications is that uh, there has been a really big change in terms of uh, digital finance and digital banking. And this is something that will continue post-pandemic. So if grandma, even grandma, who is not used to uh, shopping online, starts shopping online and paying online, uh, that we know is something that's going to stay. And of course, in the statistics, we're showing that convention banking is down and digital banking is up. Uh, you know, by, by some uh, consulting firms' polls, 90% of consumers are able to uh, go into digital payments through this e-commerce boom that we've seen in the pandemic. Um, a lot of companies, uh, especially in retail, want to be a homepage. So they don't want to go through, people to go through three homepages to get to them. They want to be a homepage where people can consolidate, you know, they can enter there and then uh, uh, shop there, do different things there, and just a lot, there's a lot of consolidation that has happened during the pandemic. And of course, China is the one that has really seen uh, e-commerce revenue gains uh, as a top market. I think the big question is really, we have seen all this change, precipitous change, but how much of this is going to stay? 
how much of this is going to be permanent changes, how much of this is going to just go back to the old normal. So we're going to look beyond the pandemic and see what are the permanent shifts. So we're projecting in terms of uh, commerce, I'm talking about more generally uh, commerce, not just retail. Uh, what we have seen is that a massive amount of data has been collected during the pandemic uh, with a lot of companies, especially consumer facing ones, uh, pivoting to digital and there's a rise of data driven commerce. And with China leading, uh, we're seeing that there, it's going to be a little bit moderated. So if you look at the curve, there will be growth, but there will be a little bit uh, slower growth than what we saw during 2020. And this really reflects uh, people's muscle memories. Some people do want to go back to digital by uh, non-digital buying, physical shopping. We want to meet in the room and, uh, and see each other. And uh, people are going to go back to their old habits to some extent, but some of the conveniences are really here to stay. And especially uh, in China and also other parts of Asia, uh, we will see this change being somewhat uh, permanent and also unstoppable. Uh, one example is uh, cashless payments. That is a, an area where China is really leading, but uh, most of Asia are, is not really far behind. And payment is really a funda fundamental part that links uh, commerce with finance. And right now, uh, in terms of payment methods, if you look at cash versus non-cash, uh, you know, 2019 versus a forecast uh, two years from now, it really is uh, the non-cash payments that are going to be leading. Um, China has a duopoly, somewhat of du duopoly, with Tenpei and Alipay really taking up about 90% of uh, the cashless payment markets, at, uh, and also in terms of all the non-cash retail payments, it's about half of that. Uh, and another notable uh, change that we're seeing that is over the horizon is uh, China's uh, DCEP that's happening, and of course that's another separate in-depth discussion that we can have, but uh, it is going to challenge the duopoly of Alipay and WeChat Pay, and really designed really as a replacement of the reserve money system. It's pegged to the renminbi uh, on the one-to-one -one ratio, and this is going to bring a lot of change, and the Chinese government is hoping that uh, the 2022 Winter Olympics will be a time that uh, some of the companies are expected to start using uh, the, the DCEP, and now it's being tested across different provinces. So looking specifically at China, uh, and you know, I think that afterwards uh, there'll be a, a recorded video, so I think it's really hard to see, but I just wanted to show you, this is uh, one of the graphics, uh, we've translated it, um, in China's latest 14 five year plan, and China has actually made what we call tax acceleration um, a really major part of the plan. It's hoping for more innovation driven growth, it's hoping for more environmentally sustainable growth, um, and what's really interesting is that it is looking at uh, uh, state-owned enterprises and also uh, domestic companies in addition to multinational companies uh, playing a role um, in participating in the digital economy. And for the first time ever, uh, China actually has a target set for the digital economy. Uh, it's a share of GDP. Uh, China is hoping that has a goal of growing it from 7.8% to 10% in five years. And China being such a large economy, that is quite a major uh, and quite an ambitious goal. One of the things that must happen uh, for this digital economy to happen is infrastructure. So China also prioritizes infrastructure, and as you know, the digital part, so not just bridges and roads, but digital connectivity has been a big part of China's uh, stimulus following the pandemic, and you know has been really taking a a big leap through the pandemic. So even though it was a crisis for China, they have taken it as an opportunity uh, to foster infrastructure growth. And in terms of the uptake, in terms of internet use, it already has grown um, a lot in the past 10 years to almost 80% uh, in terms of internet penetration. And before the pandemic, there were many 5G pilot cities all over China in 2019 and even more now. And so of course, the, the plumbing of that digital uh, has to do with digital infrastructure. And you know, we know also that other countries, notably the US is saying, you know, in order to compete in the 21st century, we need to make sure that the, the infrastructure in place is in place. So one of the big uh, features that China has invested in is digital infrastructure. And that's going to really be the new electricity that powers uh, different industries. So I'm going to 
actually going to talk a bit about uh, a topic that's really related. Um, there's been a spike in interest, of course, in technologies like artificial intelligence and also data an analytics. As you all know, there's been an exploding demand for data services. But what does this really mean uh, in terms of how corporations and businesses are thinking about how to combine that with human work and skill sets? Is it a disruptive force? Is it a huge opportunity? I think uh, you know people will have will debate that. But you know I'm just going to give a little bit of uh, pointers here. So in terms of the future of work, oops, sorry, what we're seeing is that. Um, We are really shifting to a hybrid world of work. So when we are past the pandemic, um, not everybody will go back to the old normal of work, and not everybody will be continuing these flexible work arrangements. The reality is going to be somewhere in the middle. And again, we have done two, uh, you know, we're showing here just two surveys. Uh, one of the ones has been done by McKinsey and Cognizant showing that 50% uh, of executives across different industries are allowing uh, you know, a small proportion of their employees to continue to work remotely for part of the week. And of course, we see a lot of variation between different industries. So information and technology is, is an industry that traditionally has had more flexibility, whereas something like accommodation and food service, right? I mean, we'll see uh, a, a growth in post-COVID in terms of flexible working arrangements, but by and large, it's a very small pro proportion. And at the Economist Corporate Network, among our C-suite members, we have done a poll uh, asking what uh, companies will do in terms of doing businesses differently. And so uh, about half of the people uh, are saying that they will continue flexible working arrangements with more than half of the employees in their location. And it's also confirmed that many of the companies, 70%, are investing more in digital offerings. And in terms of the rise of the remote work, the widespread use of digi uh, digital and video calls, what we're also seeing, um, actually in the latest magazine, we talked about a piece of research that's been done on uh, technology patents. And we found that there's a spike in terms of patents uh, applied in the work from home technology space. So that is something that uh, uh, innovation is happening and it is here to stay. And in terms of companies, when you have more uh, employees that are really dispersed and working from home, you need more high quality equipment and also better cyber security in place. And I think some of your other speakers are gonna be talking about that in more detail later on. Um, we look at labor markets. Um, actually, uh, the economist has a very positive outlook on human work. Uh, labor markets are really changing, but if we look at the employment rate uh, and what we look at is not just what we hear in the news all the time, which is how much unemployment there is, but what we are looking at is we look at labor market health in terms of the working age employment rate. And before COVID, in a lot of countries here, just to show three major economies, it's really grow, uh, it's growing. And actually for, for workers, despite the high automation, uh, things are going quite well uh, before COVID. And what we are predicting after COVID is that the pandemic ultimately will make things better by speeding up the changes that are already underway, and the rise of remote work will actually introduce more flexibility in terms of how people earn their living. And so net net is going to be good for workers, and especially for some of the higher educated workers. And I just you know show you one example from the U.S. Uh, the higher educated workers are able to work more uh, with good jobs and also more flexibility and. Uh, there's anecdotal evidence that there's a, a jump in employee approval of their companies following the pandemic, uh, especially in terms of communication and transparency. So I would wonder if some of you are seeing that in your companies as well. So just the last two slides, um, you know, we know that the data economy is here, but who really is benefiting? Um, uh, the corporate sector is benefiting. Uh, basically, it's a, a winner, winner takes all or winner takes most scenario. Uh, data savvy corporates are the ones that are the ones that are winning. And from what we hear uh, during the pandemic, the ones that were prepared. Uh, it's a little bit like the pandemic came like a tsunami with no notice. Those who were prepared were able to cope much better and uh, much, much more able to pivot to technology. Uh, some of the people who have the skills at performing the actual work, uh, labeling pictures, things that are, uh, you know, I think that if you're 
deep into the uh, AI and machine learning um, business, you would know that, that would, that's one of the skills. Um, you know, driving data gathering vehicles, uh, that's another skill. People were actually performing the data work. Um, the, the, the picture on the left is us cheekily combining a human face with an algorithm, uh, you know, kind of an AI face, and basically humans who are able to work along side AI are going to be the ones benefiting. Um, and also consumers are the ones going to be, be benefiting because they're going to get better service, better recommendations, and more efficient with technology. Uh, the losers, of course, are some of the economies, especially the developing ones in Asia, that was counting on demographic dividend and really just providing the raw data, not having digital infrastructure, being data illiterate for most of the population. Uh, smaller companies will have a challenge because really it's a winner takes all, winner takes most kind of space. And I think one thing that, we, that we'll be thinking about, we'll be seeing on the headlines, is how uh, people think about uh, data ownership, data property rights. So are people uh, just providing their data for free or do they have some ownership over it? My last slide really is uh, just uh, talking about the, the amount of data that has come through uh, in the world. And the data economy, of course, we know is growing really quickly. China has seen the largest growth and other regions are not really far behind. And there's one estimate that says that uh, in 2020 and 2021, what we have seen is that the data produced these two years has been more than all the data produced since the advent of computers. So that is really astounding. And what this really means is that data literacy is going to be very important. There's a greater need um, for required skills uh, of people um, knowing how to work with data, how to work alongside data, analytical reasoning, like what we have found in the recent ECM survey that we did among senior executives in Asia and also Middle East and Africa. So what I want to leave you with is that we do have still a, uh, quite an uncertain and bumpy road ahead to recovery. And I think crises don't really come bigger than what we've experienced with COVID-19. Um, and we face really big changes uh, in the technology space and in tech acceleration, and also the, the rapid changes that we're seeing in terms of how it impacts human work. And there are both disruptions and also huge opportunities that uh, are to be had. So with some imagination and innovation, and also equipped with solid information and, uh, and support, I hope that tech acceleration will be bringing about many new opportunities for your companies. So thank you very much. She has already introduced the theme of today, tech acceleration. Uh, my presentation today is going to talk about the dark side of tech acceleration, which is cybersecurity. And let me begin now. Okay, so this uh, Jenna has already covered. Is a digital era. All the corporations, all the organizations, they're adopting more and more technology because the, the technology adoption has increased largely because of the barrier of adoption that has gone down. Previously, only the largest corporates and organizations can afford the IT budget to deploy digital initiatives. With the recent technology uh, evolution and improvements, a very simple SMEs are able to afford the budget to kickstart the digital initiatives. It is the lowering of that barrier of entry that has sparked a deliverable of digital adoption amongst all the organizations that we see. But again, like I said right at the beginning, this brings a problem. Um, before I talk about the problem, I want to, I want to home into why we have a bigger problem in terms of cyber, cyber security. If you look at this picture here, it's a little complicated, but let me explain. Um, in the good old days, all the IT environment is almost completely private. You have your branch office, you have your factories, it's connected by a private network, everything is private. The only thing that is sort of quasi-public is your email. Everyone's happy. Cybersecurity attack services is a lot smaller. So th those days you're talking about email virus, spam, very simple stuff. However, when you get to a higher level of technology adoption, what you get is IoT. You get your applications on the cloud. Um, you have your mobile device. You have your end users working from home, remotely logging in from God knows where in the world uh, through a broadband via the internet. The attack services is a lot, a lot bigger. That's, that's number one. 
Secondly, as you adopt more and more digital technology, you put more and more of your asset, your value, your business into those digital assets. That, that is actually an incentive for anyone who wants to attack you because they could really take you for ransom if you have so much at stake in your digital assets, right? So the more you use, the more is at stake. And thirdly, the hackers are also very cheeky, very advanced. In good old days, you put a firewall there and then you think, that's fine, I'm fine. I'm perfectly happy, no longer the case. Um, more recent examples, ransomware, serial layer attack, uh, and even some quite advanced example of an attack, which I'd like to share with you. Um, Bitcoin, everyone knows about this. Coinbase just ran IPO last night, share went up 30, 40%. If anyone of you is a shareholder, congratulations. Do you know that the most advanced hackers are actually making use of Bitcoin and mining technologies to do hacking? And I'm gonna share with you one case from one of our customers. Um, so what happens is, our customers obviously large corporations, have a lot of servers, um, and we help them look at the look after the IT environment. One day we noticed that miraculously all the servers that we monitor, the CPU utilization has been very stable. In fact, it's, it's dead stand still at 60% for a long period of time. It doesn't go up, it doesn't go down, it just stay flat at 60%, right? And we noticed something different. Something is, is wrong because it's very unusual, very abnormal, very, very unusual. It should, it should go up and down. And then we trade, we got the client, and then we, we finally, after a good few hours, more than days of work, we found out that our environment was compromised. And a hacker was actually using their spare CPU capacity to do Bitcoin mining. So they are, they are not stealing your data, they're not stealing your servers, they're stealing your computing power for their own benefit, right? Our, our estimate after the, attack, after the attack is that because of that attack, I think the hacker has made about 100k US dollars worth of Bitcoin due to that attack. Well, luckily that sort of attack didn't really compromise our customer's data and IT environment, but still, benefit was being made without permission. So this is the extent of sophistication of cybersecurity attack that could happen today, right now. Obviously, to prevent this sort of attack is very, very subtle. And it requires a lot of effort. It's, it's about money, but it's not about just a budget. It's about a lot of effort. You need to continue to monitor it. You need to spend a lot of time when something happened to handle the incidents. You need to retain and process a lot of incidents, events, data log. And once you see anything, uh, the whole forensic process, again, requires not only effort, but expertise. So all this are required in order for you to successfully defend yourself and your IT environment from any attack. Today, I want to introduce one concept of analytics-driven cybersecurity. Key word is really analytics. Because previously, as you mentioned, your attack service increases as your IT environment gets more complex you have more IT devices. That just means there are more and more data, more and more log, which means literally you're finding a needle in a haystack every time when you're under attack, right? So the ability to analyze, to find out where the problem is, becomes a critical capability for you to defend yourselves. One thing that is good is that any attack will leave their fingerprints, the digital traces. So as long as you can find it, you can cure it, right? Um, there's always uh, a cure for every attack factor that can be handled. That's not a problem. 
The difficulty is actually in finding it. Therefore, what we believe uh, conceptually, the, the, the uh, logical steps to prevent yourself from coming under attack is to find it, analyze it, and, and then to tackle it. But out of which the first two steps is the hardest. This is a typical framework of how you should handle your cybersecurity. We broke it down into seven steps. First three steps is basically collecting the information from different sources so you can start analyzing things. So we will do real-time monitoring of your digital assets, subject to your approval, of course. Uh, user monitoring as well, not just the, um, the digital assets. Your user behavior is also uh, suspicious sometimes and will come under monitoring. Threat intelligence, which is what is happening in the outside world, what other experience, what other people are experiencing in terms of cyber attacks. So these are the information sources that we collect as a basis for further analysis. Then we go into the analytics phase. We look at analytics, we look at the different logs, we correlate the events, we try to detect if there's any incidents. And when we find an incident, obviously we'll respond. We'll talk to you, we'll find out the solution, we'll, we'll work with you and um, you know, patch up um, and fix the issue. The last one is actually important but often neglected, use case library. Every time we handle an event, we store it. We continually use this experience to enrich our knowledge base. And this is important because the knowledge base, uh, a continuous, uh, up-to-date knowledge base is very effective in helping us and you to protect our environment. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce what we can offer. It's the CBC, which is our managed security services. Uh, this uh, services is not a technical solution. It's a combination of technical solution, our SOC, which is Security Operating Center, as well as our people in the SOC. Overall, that becomes a solution that we can help you. The key concept of our managed security services is that it's a holistic view because I'm sure every one of you in your IT organization will have all sorts of protective device, firewall, WAF, antivirus, etc., etc. All of them is supposed to serve the purpose of stopping certain types of cybersecurity attack. However, there is no totality view, and that is very important because later on I will share a case whereby when the attack surface is that wide, uh, actually clues of cybersecurity attack will come up in different aspects of your IT environment. So therefore having a total view is critical. In order to get a total view, we have to analyze a lot of information. So earlier on I mentioned a little bit, this one goes into a bit more detail. Obviously we need to look at the network traffic. We will look at the intrusion data, Chances are you will already have an intrusion protection device. We will, we will look at the endpoint. Later on, we'll have experts who will talk more about it because this is one of the most common um, entry point of cybersecurity attack. Threat intelligence, we've already covered. Malware authentication, and all your assets and identities. Once we collect all this information, what we will do is to monitor all your security activities and log. More importantly, we will correlate across different security events and sequence it. Later on, I'll give you an example. This is, this is where the professional uh, services will show its value. We'll validate that alarm, we'll prioritize, review, investigate, and then work out with you on the appropriate solution. This page where will be slightly more depth technical, but I'll go through it rather quickly. This is the architecture of our MSS solution. The key thing that I want you to put your attention to is the log collector. The log collector serves the purpose of collecting all the information from your IT environment before it sends to our analytic, analytics platform for further analysis, investigation, etc. etc. The reason why I want to highlight this is. The log collector can be placed anywhere. 
uh, there are solutions in the market that will play this, but the whole platform, it sits on the cloud, and therefore the log collector will also sit on the cloud. What we do offer is, we, we should offer, we will offer both scenarios. You want to place it on the cloud, that's fine. But we also offer an on-premise log collector solution. And the reason I want to highlight this is because of compliance issues. You know, apart from security compliance, it's very important. And depending on which countries that you operate, sometimes you are allowed, sometimes you are not allowed to put your data log outside of your office premises. So in order to have that technical flexibility, it's important. And this is the value of our MSS services. But I want to share with you one case to demonstrate how our professional services is able to help you detect and handle a subtle attack. And when it comes to that, allow me to go back to my little cheat sheet because it's quite detailed, right? Uh, when I tell, when you know that there's an attack, obviously you know. But imagine you're in the following situation and you only see this the event. So uh, the first the first signal of a potential attack only came in the morning. And what happens was uh, there will be alert, an email alert sent to you to say that there's an internal network scanning. So someone within your organization seems to be scanning your IT environment. That's an initial alert. Any IT administrator may think this is maybe a little bit unusual, but not too much of a threat. So, uh, but two hours later, something else happened. There was a brute force attempt towards one of the window user's account. Okay, so one of your window user's account, someone was trying to hack it. At this point in time, our team already picked up the phone and called the customer and said, look, someone is trying to do this, uh, you better be aware. The extra part that we can do though is our team actually managed to correlate this particular attempt with the internal network scanning two hours earlier because we can trace that it's from the same IP address, right? So this is our value. We manage to sequence and correlate the events and tell you there's something fishy going on. Then our customer at that time was already alerted. Half a day later, remote code execution to exploit one of the Windows servers, right? Again, as a separate independent incident, you will already be you will already have been alerted. Again, our team are able to tell you actually this third incident is related to the first two that I mentioned, and they're spaced apart several hours later. You have to imagine in a real life situation, in between, you are also receiving God knows how many alerts, emails from your boss and colleagues in the midst of it. By the time we see this third attempt, we immediately call our customers. We tell them this is something serious, you need to be aware, you need to fix your server, you need to fix your Windows Service account, Windows user, user account, okay? They did all that. Next day, somehow, someone tried to create a new internal local user account next day. That, that creation attempt was unsuccessful because we have already fixed a patch after the, after the third event a day earlier. However, if we hadn't done that, the fourth attempt would have allowed the creation of a fake local user account that would have admin right, which means from that point onwards, the hacker can do anything they want. So this is a case example of how our SOC team managed to help our customers to demonstrate our capabilities, to help them uh, prevent uh, security, uh, security attack, uh, subtle security attacks, uh, well, in the, well in advance. Um, it, it's actually very difficult to, to detect. Now that I replay the full story to you, you will see it. But again, imagine you were in real life, uh, uh, receiving hundreds of emails every day. That, that's the subtlety, and that's the difficulty. Apart from pretty much saving you in a desperate situation or before that desperate situation happens, our service also covers a more uh, regular update every month, every quarter, if you, uh, depending on your choice, our service manager, our SOC staff 
our security analysts who meet with you, who go through the incidents with you, uh, will make recommendations on how you can improve um, the security of your IT environment. So these are the things that we will, will, we will, as part of our services, there's also a dashboard that we have done, so if you want to, you can log in and you can see what our SLC sees uh, in order to do whatever checking that you want to do internally. This is from the last page. What I want to highlight is our managed security services. The core of it is not the technology that we use. The core of it is our people, and it's 2014. Uh, they are experts in security. They see across all the customers at tech service that we help to manage, and therefore, the experience accumulation is at a speed that is unrivaled by any typical in-house team, because we just see more, right? And this is very important if you need to be up to date with the latest security and tech. So this is the core of why our service is valuable. So today, I, we are living in connected world. Everything is being connected. And at the same time, we are facing a lot of cyber threat, as what Taylor shared, uh, the dark side of the digital transformations. Um, you talk about, uh, Actually, in his presentation, gave us the hints about the challenges of today's security operation. Is the expertise. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about today is about how we can uh, have a better security operations. There's a lot of uh, good technology out there to help you to protect your environment. But the biggest challenge coming is how do we manage it? Like, if you don't manage the security solutions, then it it doesn't work. Like we need to understand what's going on in our network. We need to fine tune the policy, uh, turn on the protections, which is useful. So, first, what is today's challenge of, about the cyber security uh, operations? First, there's no central platform. So there's a lot of technology uh, out there. Uh, company invest millions of dollars to to uh, choose a lot of technology to protect the environment: firewall, threat prevention, sandboxing cloud security, a lot of solutions out there. They are good. But again, if you don't manage it, it doesn't work. So, but the challenge is how we can manage the, a lot of solutions. This is a very uh, difficult part. Another um, problem is because the tools that you use is not integrated. So sometimes you find threat in the firewall. So you want to understand where the threat is already come in to your endpoint. You need to look into another console. It's make it very difficult to understand the attack chain. So it become another chance the people start doing manually. They consolidate all the information from different consoles. Uh, some of the companies they, they will uh, invest on this, uh, CM solutions to consolidate all the data inside one place. But if you uh, talk, talk about the guy who's having seen is one uh, statement is called garbage in, garbage out. If you send all the logs in this one page, you don't analyze this. This is what outcome is this garbage. So you don't really understand it. The fourth challenge is the talent. There's a shortage of global talent. Uh, if you look at the um, uh, survey we done by uh, Forbes in 2020, uh, in the global, we need 3 million cybersecurity experts to support these security operations. But 64% of organizations comment they have challenge to find an expert to support their security operations. Another challenge is other overload. Uh, as I said, our company invests a lot of money on different security solutions. And every day they are seeing a lot of alerts. What is important? What is not important? We need someone to analyze the data, to find valuable information and take the response. And because of the alert overload, all the people, all the security operation people, spend a lot of time to analyze the alert. And then they, they don't have enough time to think about the future, think about how to improve the security. What is the gap? Where they need to improve? So in 2021, uh, our strategy in track home is fit the customer need. First, how to secure the environment with the best security protections. And second, simplify their operations. Third, 
with an integrated architecture. So one of the uh, changes that we made in 2020 is you are using checkpoint border, which is good. And you will know our checkpoint is a very like a, it's a leading cybersecurity company. We have a lot of security solutions. Today we have over 80 security products. So in 2021, we make a change to let our customers to more easy to understand what checkpoint is operating. So uh, today we have solutions to protect the network, which is a firewall, uh, threat prevention, IPS. We have solutions to protect the cloud infrastructure, uh, also the uh, end user computing, uh, like the remote access, the end the mobile, and also we have the management platform. So first, we, we now have a quantum series of uh, level security, which is uh, protecting the uh, enterprise, enterprise network environment, as well as the I, IoT network infrastructures. And for cloud, we have the CloudGuard family, which uh, provide the comprehensive cloud security solutions including the network protection, the security posture management, and also the workload protection, including the container, surveillance function, and also API. And last but not least is about the, is the Harmony. The Harmony is a, a SASE platform, which is uh, the consolidated cloud uh, security deliver platform to uh, protect our customer and user computing, like the endpoint computer, like the mobile, with a cloud deliver uh, service. And today, I will more focus on the implementation, the management part, because, well, as I said, we have a lot of technology to use, but how we manage it is more important than what the solution we are using. Just a recap of uh, the um, technology that I just uh, quickly uh, mentioned about, uh, we have the uh, checkpoint implement architecture. The mission statement of checkpoint is we secure everything. We want to protect our customer from all these cyber threats. So to explain uh, what Checkpoint is doing, uh, there's a lot of security framework outside. I think this is one of the uh, good examples to explain what Checkpoint is doing. This is from Gamma, the adaptive security architecture. And yeah, first and foremost, it's talking about the PD. Yeah, everything when you're doing business or cyber security, first, we need to understand what is the risk, what are the risks we are facing. And then, how, what is the impact if we fail to protect our environment, for example. So this is the first page. And what Checkpoint can help is, uh, we did a lot of uh, so-called architecture review workshop with our customer. And we understand our customer infrastructure and then we help them to decide the overall security uh, protections. Uh, not only by new product, sometimes we just recommend to re-architect their environment to turn on some protection to increase the security effectiveness. And second is about prevention, which is always top of the mind in checkpoint development team. All the technology we develop is based on preventive approach. The reason why is if you look at the solution you're using today, they have a very good detection rate, but eventually it just tells you what happened. For example, a malware attack. The solution that gives you the alert that someone downloaded the malware. But eventually the user opened the malware, infection start. And today the sophisticated uh, malware, they can spread across the network within minutes. So this is why we talk about prevention. If we see the malware, is a file is malicious, we brought it. So no one can get access to the malicious malware. So from a technical, uh, from a security perspective, you save a lot of time to do the remediation because everything is prevented. Okay, next, detect. After prevention, why we need to still uh, look at the detection? Uh, for example, uh, one good example is we have a customer, they, they're using our uh, monitoring services. Uh, every month, we will have a review section with our headquarters people to look at their um, our detected um, data, data, data in their environment. Uh, one of the uh, cases is um, we find a malware uh, incident in their environment. Based on our threat intel, this malware is very unique. Although it's a, uh, come from a uh, very old, like a, a famous malware family, but the variance is very unique. What is the insight? This is the target attack, not a generic uh, massive malware attack. So 
they need to take action. Although the malware is already prevented, but think about the target attack. This is not the only channel the malware come in. There's another channel who are not using malware or using other techniques to target this customer. So they need to take actions. This is why I, I, I mentioned after the prevention, we need to look at the law to understand what is the attack. And then if there is a, any other further action we need to take, respond to it. So the last is response. So how do we do the response? Uh, it's based on the, a lot of uh, um, analysis. Okay, so what are the tools we offer to help the customer to have a better security operation? This is the security uh, checkpoint implementations, the platform that we build uh, to help our customer to operate a security solution in a more effective way. We have two components. Uh, first, is talk about the policy management. We have a unified management architecture. Uh, all this technology that I just mentioned, like the quantum network security, the cloud guard, uh, and harmony, everything matched in one place. It is a cloud management uh, platform, so uh, it's easy to use, just a subscription, then you can uh, have the access to our management platform to manage your security operations. Of course, in some sense, uh, some of the industry, they, they will not using uh, a lot of cloud service because of the regulation requirement. We also offer own payments. Uh, offering. So, next is about the uh, SOC and XDR. Today, uh, we are talking about detections uh, and response. And the two steps we offer is actually from our checkpoint research team. We have a research team um, to analyze the, uh, the cyber threat. And if you go to our research.checkpoint.com, you will see a lot of uh, research from our, our team. For example, the um, attack uh, for mobile, uh, we, we just public recently. So this is all from our research team. And, and today we start to offer our own tools to our customer because we, we find that this is uh, very useful and we believe our customer is also looking for these help, tools to help them to do uh, better security. So the first uh, thing we all, the tools we offer is how to minimize the law to an actual actionable event. Uh, we make use of AI technology. This is one of the example from our customer. Uh, they, have, uh, they are a uh, 2,000 user uh, enterprise. Uh, in a week, they have uh, 59 million logs. And after the AI engine analyzed it, uh, we find that there's only like 3,000 activities, malicious activity, but it's only like targeted uh, 40 assets. But in fact, there's only 11 machine is actually infected. Think about if you use human to analyze 50 million logs, how much time we need to find out this 11 infected holes? Week, a month, I don't know. But it takes long, much longer time than using an AI. That's, this is what the AI value. We, we are not just uh, identifying what is the infected hole, we also indicate what is the prior, priorities. Because we are using the AI, we're analyzing the infected host behavior to understand the, uh, what kind of impact it's doing. Then we tell the security operation people what is your priority. So we give you uh, the percentage of the uh, infection, uh, the, uh, how critical is it? So the people can start work on the critical phase, uh, and then after it, uh, work on the less critical uh, is it. And in terms of response, um, when we find out the infected host, what we can do, we contain the infections, right? So we also provide lightweight agents, just get it from the portal, we install it, the agent in the infected machines, we will contain the incident, block all the subsequent attack and also provide very uh, informative forensic analysis including the uh, where the attack come in, what kind of process actually manipulated and what for example if the data leak event, what data is actually sent out. This is the forensic report that gives you very informative uh, information and follow up actions. Next if you do want to do more investigations about the attack, for example, you want to understand more about malware, we provide the platform that 
uh, allows the user to search our Intel, Drive Intel database. For example, you just key in the MP5 of the malware. We will show you all the related information of this malware. For example, uh, where is it from and what type, what industry that, that malware is targeting and also the timeline of this malware. Where we first seen the malware and then uh, where is the uh, sprite and last but not least is also other uh, uh, research data that we will provide from the third party like VirusTotal, like uh, Google. We will also provide them more data to help you to investigate. And we also provide a service that allows the customer to do the malware analysis. Just upload the malware, the files, to our platform. We will give you all the data that we find from the files, of the malware. For example, the malware family. For example, the, uh, the technique that the malware used according to Mitra framework, and, and so on. And last, um, it's not be enough, and we also provide the tracking platform. So for example, in the case, we see a malware coming through email, right? And then we want to understand, in terms of email, is there any other, other way the malware is delivered to our infrastructure? Well, you can, we can we provide the tracking platform. You just key in, searching. We also provide some predefined queue. So, uh, and of course, we can do custom security. Uh, for example, that I said is we just key in the malware name or the MD5, and then it will show you all the uh, uh, detected uh, event in the network, uh, not just from email, maybe from the network download or from. Um, uh, through the social uh, media like WhatsApp or whatever. So everything, we, uh, we have the one page to help you to uh, understand the attack and then understand the attack service. And this is actually the last tools uh, we are providing to understand the external threat. Not only the internal, we also provide customer the platform. Uh, in this, uh, how this works is uh, very simple. You just type in the, uh, the common domain. For example, abc.com in our platform. Our platform will constantly search in the internet to find all the related cyber threat to this particular domain. For example, we find localized domain, abc, whatever.com. And then we find that uh, this domain is actually a phishing domain. Someone is trying to use a similar uh, localized domain to fish your customer. You know, there's something wrong. You need to take care of it. What the action we can help, we can help to take down the service, take down the malicious domain uh, through our incident response service. This is the what our infrastructure looks like. Uh, you will see a lot of uh, different components in the uh, environment. But um, I just want to highlight all the components of our checkpoint, the security component, is managed in one single platform, the infinity management uh, platform. To summarize uh, what I said, uh, what I shared today, uh, Trackpoint we, today, we, we, are, we are now offering the enterprise wide visibility, including the network, the endpoint, mobile, and also IoT. Not only internal uh, 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 events, we also work in the external threat, like what I said, with, um, using the domain uh, monitoring uh, platform that we provide to, to look at the any kind of attack using your uh, company domain. And to analyze all the data, we have the uh, threat cloud, the global threat intelligence, to, um, to analyze all the data that we collected from your environment and also from the external sources to help you to, under, to, pro, uh, to provide more accurate uh, protection with the using of AI technologies. So, thank you very much.